Good morning. I have scrolled on social media for hours, binge watched TV, yet all of a sudden I'm tired when God wants to talk to me. Think it not strange when we encounter these things because the enemy is on a rampage, ready to kill, steal, and destroy. Yet many will blame God and let the devil steal their joy. So let's get into it. So when we think about the news today, I really have a question for many of us and even for myself this morning as I woke up and I was up in the middle of the night, which lately I've been doing that. And I started to wonder, have we become desensitized, distracted, and deceived? And when I think about that, when we look all around, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of destruction, and we know that God is omnipresent. We know that God can stop it, but many people may wonder, why isn't God stopping these things? And so for many today, they are celebrating Jesus's resurrection. And there, even as it relates to that, there are some people who say, well, he didn't really uh, go to the cross in March or April. And, and so then there's this dispute regarding when Jesus rose. But the one thing we can all agree on is that he did. And so when I think about today and I think about every day, I'm just grateful that God cares about us enough to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. And so when we think about being human, we think about suffering, we think about the perceived silence of God amidst so much chaos. Many of us forget the fact that the enemy came down to the earth. And so when we think back to Revelation 12, it talks about the war in heaven. And it talks about the fact that the enemy, the dragon, after getting into a fight in heaven with Michael, so he was in a war with Michael. So in verse seven, Revelation 12, it says, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. The devil accuses us before God day and night. But it continues in verse 11 and says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. And so it also continues in verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens, ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she may fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And it goes on to say in verse 17, and the dragon was wroth. He was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So when we think about what we hear in the news today, when we think about all the things that are happening and we may wonder, does God really care? Is he there? God is there. He has given us a way to ensure that when we do leave this thing called earth, that we will be with him for eternity. And so when we think about the times that we're living in, yes, it is perilous. There have been a lot of prophecies that have 
uh, been sent forth. And some people have a problem with the prophecy. A lot of times, I think, as especially as believers in Jesus Christ, we argue about the wrong things. And this is exactly what the devil wants. He wants us to be deceived. He wants us to be distracted. He wants us to just live our lives in this state of constant confusion. However, <laughs> in Luke 21, God tells us about the times. So when we think about God caring, we think about the destruction that we see. The signs of the times is in Luke 21. And it says, and as some spake of the temple, starting in verse five, how it was adorned with godly, goodly stones and gifts, he said, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in, there, in the which there shall not be one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him saying, because we think about the signs of the times, we think about what's happening now. There's a lot of things that are being torn down. And they asked him saying, master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, take heed. So pay attention that ye be not deceived for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, the kingdoms against kingdoms. Great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain, say, nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed by parents and brethren and kinfolks, friends. Some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea, the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And so when we think about this and we think about life and we think about the fact that this was written before and it was told to us that this was to come, this was going to happen a lot of people get upset with God because they're like, well, why did you allow this to happen? But if you think back to Revelation 12, it says the enemy knows his time is short and he seeks to kill, steal and destroy. Essentially, the enemy does not have good things in mind for us. The enemy hopes that we will perish in our wickedness. But one thing about God is he does not want us to perish in our wickedness. And that is the thing that I think the enemy is tricking people into believing. He's believing, he wants us to believe that God wants us to die where we are. And God is like, no, I do not want anyone to perish. I want them to repent. I want them to believe. 
And it's interesting because when we think about God, when he sent his son to die on the cross, he rose. And he rose to save us so that we may see God again. Because of the fall of man and because of sin, this is how we ended up here. And so when we think about it, even in Ezekiel 3, it talks about a righteous person and a sinner, essentially. And in Ezekiel 3, verse 20, it says, I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die. Talking about the person who has been warned, but chooses not to turn away from their wickedness in verse 19. But then it talks about the fact that righteous people, so again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So in Ezekiel 3, it talks about the fact that God has raised up watchmen. He has raised up people who are here to sound the alarm. And there's a lot of people who are sounding the alarm, but people are more mad at the people sounding the alarm than the people committing the sin or the people lying or the people doing all of these things. And so the word reminds us to warn. So in 21, it says, nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, arise, go forth into the plain and I will talk with thee there. And so in this particular case, the prophet was talking to God because the thing is, many people are rebellious right now in this season. And we don't have the ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. And the Holy Spirit is speaking. And so it tells us this at the beginning of Ezekiel 3 that we have to go forward. We have to share because if we don't, the blood of the, blood of the people we fail to talk to or share the gospel with will be on our hands. And it's because he wants us to let people know what is happening. And so in verse 10, Ezekiel 3, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thine ears. Go, get thee to them of captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Then the spirit took me up and I heard behind me a great voice of a great rushing saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. I heard also the noise of the wings of a living creature that touched one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and a noise of a great rushing. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went into bitterness in the heat of, the, of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Shabar. And I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days, his mission. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came upon me saying, son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die and thou give, givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And so when I think about this, I think about Revelation 12, I think about Luke 21, and it warns us that one in Revelation 12, the devil is mad. He is wroth with anger. He has come down to us because he knows his time is short. He is waging war against the remnant of God's seed. But if you all recall, 
in Revelation 12, it says that we are able to overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb, Jesus, who rose on the third day and the power of our testimony. And so when we go back into Luke, it tells us things are going to be tough, but don't worry about what you will say. Know that these things are going to come. And further in Luke 21, it says in 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest that any hour your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Verse 36. And this is a verse that I tend to refer to often. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. And so when we think about that standing before the son of man, even in Ezekiel three, it tells us to turn from our iniquity, especially after we've been warned. And the fact that God is using people in this hour to warn, we should be grateful. We should be grateful to those people who are willing to risk their life to share the word of God with us because they don't have to. They could say, you know what? That's not my issue. I didn't commit that sin. That's that's what they did. I, I didn't do that. But listen, when God when God deals with us, that's why I have on this sweatshirt. It says curse breaker. And it's second Corinthians five and starting in verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things come become new and all things that are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And at the beginning, I talked about the fact that a lot of people go back and forth about Easter and they say, you know, it's a pagan holiday. What I will say is when you start to research the history or the etymology, um, there's a lot of things that I'm learning is what I'll say. And I would just say that you start to um, research it for yourself. Research the history of any of the celebrations that we attribute to our Lord and Savior. Research them and find out the history. Find out, you know, where this comes from, where it started, and then make a decision for yourself what ye will do based on what you know about God to be true. And so when we think about these things, we think about life. We think about the fact that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are the curse breakers. And I'll put a link to uh, where this is available. It's confidentconnotations.com. But I designed this actually last, I believe it was in 2023. It may have been even before that. Um, but it was in March, ironically, that I designed this sweatshirt. And it was because I woke up one day and I said, you know what? I am a curse breaker. I am an ambassador for Christ. So the things that are on that website, confidentconnotations.com, are ways for us to spark a conversation. So it's the connotation. And so when we think about connotations, we think about words. Connotations are the things we associate with the meaning of something or a word. And so often there are things that have been perverted because of the connotations that people attach to it. And so I wanted to figure out how can we spark a conversation to be able to share our faith? And that's where that comes from. And so when we think about the fact that, and it continues on in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, us being ambassadors for Christ. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in God's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus didn't know sin, yet he died for ours. And so when I think about that, I'm like, whew, thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy, because we can't save ourselves. We are saved 
by salvation. We are saved by God's grace, by his mercy, because the word tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But a lot of people use that as an excuse to keep on doing whatever they want to do. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, help me to see where I make mistakes. And that's why when I started this off, I talked about the fact that I'll get on social media or have scrolled for hours, then watch, binge watch TV. All of a sudden I'm tired when God wants to talk to me. I don't think it's strange that we get tired when God is speaking, but we can do everything else. And so when I felt that in my spirit this morning, I said, oh my gosh, that's powerful. Let me write it down because right now the word warns us. And so I want to talk about the warnings. So I was up in the middle of the night and I planned on recording this around like three, but I fell asleep. Go figure. Much like when Jesus was out and he was, he knew he was going to the cross and he went out to pray in the morning. So he was up praying, but all the disciples were asleep. They weren't on their watch. Like in Ezekiel three, it says, it talks about the watchmen. They weren't on their watch. They were asleep. So when they came to arrest Jesus, Jesus knew what his fate would be. He knew that he was here to save humanity. But they were they were asleep. But Jesus went to talk to his father. He woke up in the wee hours of the morning to talk to his father. Because even for him to know what was to come, it was concerning. It was hard. So I thank God that he allowed his son to be a sacrifice for my life. And I thank God that Jesus was not afraid to do the hard thing. He wasn't afraid to go to the cross. And when I think about our lives, oftentimes we think that what we do is small. We think, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long we've been in our condition. And I'll talk about that soon in Acts 3. But we look at our life situations and we think that our little part in life is small. But God is raising up people all over the world to talk about God's grace and God's mercy and to share with people and to warn. Like it says in Ezekiel 3, if we fail to tell people about God and Christ in this hour where we see so much destruction, where we see so much turmoil, people are going to start to blame God for things that is not God's fault. Because at the end of the day, if we look at what's happening in the world, the enemy is having his way. And that's because a lot of people don't want to repent. They won't, don't want to go back to God. We don't want to fast and pray. We don't want to drive out those demons. We don't want to be on our watch because we're tired. But it tells us not to get weary. Don't allow our hearts to be overtaken with the pain and the things that we see. Because it, it mentions again in Luke 21 in, in 34, verse 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting drunkenness and the cares of this life. So that day come upon you unawares for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell upon the face of the earth. But there's a promise for us. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. So this is not our home. We're here as they say, um, I think some people say I'm here for a short time, not a long time. And that's the truth. We are not here forever because it tells us that we are here on this earth, but that's for a period. And then we will go back and we will join Christ in heaven if we are willing to repent of our sins. And so when I think about a lot of the prophetic messages that I've been hearing, like for instance, um, there was a young lady, Erica Murphy, and she had a message on social media and she called it, I saw bridges collapsing. And that was a prophetic message that she released on the 5th of March. So we all know what happened on the 26th, the bridge in Baltimore collapsed. And a lot of people, they get upset when they hear these prophetic messages, but like in Ezekiel three, if God didn't care about us, he would not warn us. So March 26, 2024, the Baltimore key bridge collapses after a ship collision, CNN. Then on March 21st, 2024, the economist.com put damage to undersea cables is disrupting internet access across Africa. And this has been going on for a few weeks now. March 29th, 2024, bus plunged off a bridge in South Africa, killing 45 people. An eight year old is the only survivor. And this young lady, she just said she felt it heavy on her heart to share that she had a dream. And in that dream, that's what she saw. 
She said, I don't know if this is talking about connection with the internet. I don't know if this is talking about a literal bridge, but God showed her the collapse of a bridge in her dream. And in the word, it tells us in the end times, people will dream dreams. Our children, our women, our men will have visions and they will see things and they will share. But again, people have to have the ears to hear. And I always say, read the word for yourself and ask God to show you what it is that he wants you to see. And same thing. So Erica Murphy was one person that I saw prophesy about this, but I saw it after the fact. So I, ironically, I saw it yesterday, like in the middle of the night. Well, I guess I should say this morning. And then another person who prophesied about this, and I immediately thought about this when I saw the news of the bridge collapse in Baltimore. Um, Celestial from the Master's Voice Prophecy blog. I had seen her prophecy called Dreams, and it was from March 15th. Uh, 2024, if I'm not mistaken, that's when it was on YouTube. And as soon as I saw the news of the bridge collapse, I said, oh my gosh, I saw something about this in advance of the bridge collapsing. And it gives you chills when you're like, wow, was God trying to warn us? And it's not that was he, he is. Because like he said, don't let that day come upon you unawares. He wants us to be saved. He does not want us to perish. It is not the Lord's will that any of us shall perish in our sin. And it tells us that in the word, but what the devil will have us think is, I have time to play. It doesn't matter anyway. But the truth of the matter is it does. It does matter. And it literally says in Acts 3, verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. But what the enemy would have us to believe is that it doesn't matter. So how do we avoid the trap of the enemy? I'm going to give you three quick points, which is one, repent. We need to feel or express remorse for what we do wrong. And even for me, when I think about my life, there's a lot of things that I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm ashamed of the fact that I did that, that I said that, that I thought that. And so I go to God often and repent because I'm like, okay. And I often say, I'm not an angel, I'm saved by grace. And in fact, I wrote a book called Sins, Salvation is the New Sexy. And when I got that title, I was like, oh boy, that's that's charged because people will be upset probably just by the title. But it goes back to what I said about connotations. The connotation of the word sex has evolved over the years, but God made sex to be beautiful. And then someone in 1905 changed the word to mean, so the etymology of the word changed in 1905, and it was turned into something to refer to how someone looks and really sexualizing a person um, and how they look. But when you think about it in many, many years ago, so when sex originally came about, the word was simply referring to male or female, the division of species, particularly in humans. So sex is on applications. It means male or female. However, over time, it became something that's more explicit. So we know that sex, sexual intercourse was created by God for procreation. Even that has been perverted. And so when we think about the devil, he is crafty because he wants us to not repent. He wants us to look at things differently. So when I think of the word sexy, sexy just literally when you add a dash Y, a dash Y to anything means of. So when you think if sex meant male or female, a dash Y just means of a male or female. It's talking about the people. However, in the 20th century, the term changed. And it was to describe things that are sexually suggestive or stimulating. And so when you fast forward to today, 2024, people have been using the word to also mean things that are exciting, things that are alluring, things that have appeal. So you'll hear people talk about business as being sexy or marketing as being sexy. And so when I think about these things and I think about the etymology and you can look up um, it's called E-T-Y-M-O-M online. So essentially it's etym online. So for etymology, you can look up the etymology of the word. But again, like it said, it wasn't until the 20th century that the connotation changed to mean what it means today. So we give power 
to what the enemy tells us is whatever it is. So women, myself included, used to want to feel sexy, wanted to be look. I wanted to look good in the eyes of people. And God is like, I called you for so much more than just how you look. Society tells you to focus on your outward appearance. I focus on your heart. I want you to repent because I don't want you to go to hell in your sin. And so when I wrote the book, I was thinking about all those people, men and women, but primarily I wanted to focus on women because I feel like we have this strong sense of wanting to be loved, wanting to be liked. And when you go against the grain, meaning when you do start to focus on God, you feel almost isolated. And so it makes you sometimes backtrack thinking that that's better because you have the approval of people. Meanwhile, you're losing God's approval because you're choosing to sin. And so when I think about repentance, so the first point that I'm making as it relates to how do we avoid the trap of the enemy, I think about Acts 3. And in Acts 3, starting in verse 1, it talks about the man at the gate of the temple. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John go about to go into the temple, asked in alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them. So he listened, expecting to re receive something of them. So alms, he needed, he wanted some money. Um, then Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. So it didn't matter the fact that this man had been lame since birth, meaning he was unable to walk. He was, uh, he had, he was unable to walk without difficulty. That's the formal definition from birth. So when you think about a lot of us, we may have been in our situation for a long time. Again, hence the reason I'm wearing this. We may have been in our situation since we were born. We were born into a particular neighborhood or in, in a particular area where things were less than ideal. We, were, we come from a family of people who may have practiced um, different things that are against the word of God. And now we have to break off those curses and everything else. But God is calling us forth now. If God is speaking to you, hear him, let him talk to you, let him bring you in and talk to you. Like he talked to Ezekiel and told Ezekiel what to do. Like he talked to the apostles and told them what to do. When they went out to preach, he said, Hey, if they don't hear you, dust, shake the dust off your feet. And that's in Matthew. There are people who are not going to receive what we have to say, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't say it. So to avoid the trap of the enemy, we first must repent. Number two, we have to resist. We have to withstand and oppose. So in Acts 3, continuing on, starting in verse 12, it says, and when Peter saw it, so pretty much people were like shocked. They were amazed at the fact that this man who hadn't walked could walk. And so when we look at verses 11 through 26, it really goes on to tell us what Peter had to tell them. And he he educated them. He was like, let me advise you. Let me school you. Let me admonish you and let you know that the very person that you persecuted is the one that could save you. So when we think about society, like I have scrolling on my screen, society encourages sin, yet salvation is where true freedom begins. So in verse 11, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? Like, why are you looking at us, the people? 
as though by our own power or holiness, we made this man walk. So Peter's like, look, I didn't make him walk. This is not through me. Verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead. Hallelujah. So you see that full circle moment? Today, all around the world, there are people who are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And as I mentioned before, they there are many, there's conversations about the, the term Easter and where it came from and the holiday. But I will say, talk to God and allow him to speak to you. No matter what day it is, we know that Jesus rose. And that's the one thing that I hold true. And I'm like, okay, thank you, Lord, for the revelation. I do believe it because I have seen where Jesus and God has helped me. I know that the breath in my lungs did not come from me. It didn't come from a person. Much like Peter said, why are you glorifying me? This came from God. This is a gift through Jesus Christ. Because it says, he said, more works will we do because of the spirit that lives in us. It's not through us. It's not because we have power. We didn't create the world, but God. Okay. So going back to Acts 3, verse 14, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desire a murderer to be granted unto you. So now think about what's happening in the church, the persecution in the church, people, (laughs) what was done in the dark is coming to light. And like I said, we all fall short, myself included. There are things that I don't want to come to light because I'm like, oh gosh, I was, I was living foolish. I was living foul. And not that I was out here fornicating, acting crazy, doing like, not that I was like this wild promiscuous woman, but there were things that I did I shouldn't have done. And I knew were wrong. And that's like most of us. If, if all of us are honest with ourselves, we see this great falling away. We see these people who are blaming God because of the actions of man. And I always say, you can't judge God off the actions of man. We all have free will. Don't you understand? This is not God. The reason, the people who are trying to deceive people, because it tells us in the end days that many will come in Jesus's name. People will be deceived. So we have to know how to go to Christ for ourselves. Talk to God. I sit under ministries. I have people that I talk to that help gird me up in strength, that help teach me the word, that help me realize when I might be in error that will call me out. So in Acts 3, Peter calls them out and he told them, you denied him. You killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name has made this man strong. So in faith, and believing, and confidence. You see how I tied that all together? Confidence restored, faith restored, and faith is what made this man strong. Whom ye see and know, yea, ye, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers. But those things which God before has shewed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things when God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our father, saying unto Abraham, 
and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And so the last point of the three, first was repent, second was resist, third is desist, cease and abstain. So the last verse, unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to what? Bless you, not to curse you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision today and we cannot blame God for what we see happening when we know that the enemy was hurled down to this earth and he is angry. He is waging war with the remnant of the seed. And in the prophecy, actually in both of the prophetic messages I heard, the one by Erica Murphy, she said that in her vision, God showed her a figure, like a dark figure. Um, She said he was about 15 to 20 feet tall and it, he had on black like a cape. So when we think about the death, um, the spirit of death, what we see oftentimes with the Grim Reaper is this tall figure with this, um, with like this staff with the hook on the end and he's in all black. And sometimes they'll make the face like a skeleton. That's what it sounded like when she described it. She was like, I saw this person like creeping around the bridges. And when you think about bridges, like she said, it could be connection. It could be literal bridges, which we saw a literal bridge fall. A literal bridge that connects the whole world. A literal bridge mm -hmm. fell and God rest the souls of the men who died on that bridge. And when I think about that, I said, wow, she prophesied this on the 5th of March. And here's the thing. It also talks about the fact that it'll be your brethren who will prophesy. And a lot of people will, cannot hear from people that they know. They're like, mm, how can I hear from you? But again, in the end times, God is raising up a lot of people because he wants us to reach individuals, whoever those people are. And I'm not saying I'm not here telling you that I'm a prophet. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is I do believe that God has blessed me with the gift of teaching. And so even the Bible tells us whatever our gifts is, use that. So if God gave you a gift of prophecy, prophesy. If God gave you a gift to teach, teach. If God gave you a gift to um, edify and lift people up, edify and lift people up. We all have a purpose in this thing called life, but it's up to us to actually do what God has called us to do. And so here's the thing. If we won't do it, God will call up someone else who will. And it says it all the time. God will call up some, he will get somebody else. There was a, a popular TikTok video and the lady was like, uh, a young lady walked up to her and was like, oh, can you take my picture in a, in a store? And she was like, mm -mm, get somebody else to do it. A lot of us are sitting here like, get somebody else. And God is like, I called you. And we're like, mm -mm, nope, don't want to do it. I don't have time for this. I'll get somebody else. And God's like, all right, I gave you a chance. I'm going to get somebody else like Saul. God gave Saul a chance to be king, not because that was his perfect will, but because the people wanted a person to stand in for God, essentially. So he raised up, he had Samuel go and get Saul. So you can read all of this in um, 1 Samuel, but he went and got Saul and then Saul disobeyed God. And because of Saul's disobedience and his allegiance to people, more so than his allegiance to God, he lost his place in the kingdom. But then the kicker is he got mad at David because he listened to God. So he made the mistake of not listening to God. And then he spent all this time trying to kill the person who he used to love. Like, how does that work? You made a mistake. But yet you are going to. Um, you're you're going to try to hurt the person that helped you because of the fact that you did not listen to God. And there's a lot of people now um, who literally are mad at other people who God did call. But the reason God called them is because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. So literally, they used to be together. 
And then all of a sudden, in 1 Samuel 19, Saul is trying to kill David. And David is on the run for a long time because Saul wants to kill him. But Saul wanted to kill him because Saul didn't do what Saul was supposed to do. And there's a lot of people who now, because they are not listening to God, they want to kill the voice of the prophets. They want to kill the voice of the people God has sent. But that's because they are not doing what they are supposed to do. So in 1 Samuel 15, that is where the Lord rejects Saul as king. The Lord didn't reject him because of David. The Lord rejected him because of him. So I don't know who this is for. And I wasn't even planning on going down this path. But hey, we're here. Um because some, I don't, this is for someone. You are mad at someone else because you are failing to do what God called you to do. We are all meant to reach and teach those who we are meant to reach and teach. The Bible says we overcome the enemy through the power of our testimony, but many of us don't want to share our testimony because we don't want to look bad. We don't want, we're afraid of the judgment of people. And so in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, it says, Samuel replied to Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? So think about this now. A lot of people are like, let me sacrifice this to you, Lord God. Let me show you I'm holy by doing these things, these religious things. And God is like, I don't care about your religious things. I care about your relationship. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, a.k.a. witchcraft. And arrogance, like the evil of idolatry, it's a whole lot of idols and the idols are falling because God is tired of it because you have rejected the word of God. He has rejected you as king. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. So he acknowledged the fact I sinned. So he's feeling remorseful now, but unfortunately it was too late. I violated the Lord's commands and your instructions. I was afraid of the men. And so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. So when I think about how I started this off and all the destruction and people blaming God, God is warning us now, but many of us don't want to listen. We are rejecting God because we are worried about what people say. We are rejecting God because we don't want to hear the truth. We are rejecting God because we want to, in the words of prophetess Tiffany Montgomery, babysit our pet demons. And trust me, I'm not saying I'm holier than thou because I was just like that. Meaning there was a time I could not hear. I really couldn't because in my mind, my way was right. I was doing all these religious things. I was serving. I was doing this. I was doing that. But God is like, I'm trying to break the curse of religion because I want relationship. I want relationship. God wants relationship with you. He wants relationship with me too. And so again, how do we avoid the trap of the enemy? We repent. We resist. And we desist. We stop it. We stop it. We choose to abstain. And so on this day, Sunday, March 31st, 2024, I thank God for the breath in my lungs. I thank God for the gift of grace. I thank God for the opportunity to come before you today. And I pray that God would allow this message to minister to whoever it's supposed to minister to, that it will bless the people who need to hear this message and realize that there is a way of escape and it's to watch and pray. So know that I appreciate you all tuning in week after week. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I thank God for his guidance in this hour when there is so much destruction all around. I pray that your hearts would be strengthened and that you would know that it is not God's will that any of us shall perish in our wickedness but he sends warnings and he sends visions. He gives us grace for this place. He wants us to repent. He wants us to come back to him. He is more concerned with our relationship than he will ever be about our religion. And so I pray that this message will touch someone today. So on that note, my great grandmother used to always say, when I'm dead and gone, keep on keeping on. And when I think about 
the message from Jesus, he told them he's not going to be with them a long time, but his spirit, he leaves with them so that they can continue this work and greater works will they do because of the spirit that lives in them. So on this day and every day, may you remember that the spirit that lives on the inside of you is greater than anything that you see happening in this world. And in Luke 21, it tells us what to do. So watch and pray every day. And on that note, be blessed and keep on keeping on.